One of the legacy companies is a um, is a group of businesses that is engaged in the in the uh, food service equipment, appliance, and gadget business. Columbus, Ohio. I don't remember much about that, uh, I, but I, uh, by the time I do remember anything, uh, my family had already moved to New Jersey, to northern New Jersey. So that's really where, you know, I consider uh, growing up, and I uh, went to school there. Um, you know, had a very uh, a, a typical life. It was a, a good life. Um, was very interested in sports. Um, always wanted to be a professional uh, football player. You know, that's my first dream. But I did have dreams, and those dreams kept uh, driving me further. You know, it, it drove me into music. Discovered that I was never going to be successful in music. I, I, I worked so hard, um, but I, I found music really quite late. You know, a lot of the I got myself into a very good music school, and actually was able to graduate uh, with a degree in music. But I was always coming from behind because a lot of the kids I went to school with. My contemporaries, they were child protégés. They had parents and grandparents that were professional musicians. And uh, here I was sequestered away in my little practice room, hours upon hours upon hours every day, just working so hard for my recitals, just trying to keep up. And I couldn't do it. I just didn't have it in me. You know, I, uh, you know those dreams, um, uh, led me to New York City right after I graduated um, the university. Got an apartment in, in New York City in, in midtown Manhattan in a place called Hell's Kitchen, a really rough part of town at the time on 44th and 10th, uh, a little studio, rent-controlled studio, and got out to New York Times and I just looked under the heading of export. You see here I had a music degree, you know, so uh, international business. I, you know, how was I going to get involved in international business? I didn't have any sort of degree or any sort of experience. So I went on a job interview, got a job working in a mailroom. I was at the bottom of the bottom of the pile, but I felt that I was on top of the world. You know, here I was in New York City working in an international trading company, a uh, small little uh, studio apartment in Hell's Kitchen. It really launched my career and I worked hard. I discovered two things. I didn't even know about myself. I discovered that I was a salesman, that I could sell. See, I didn't, even though I had that skill, no one ever talked to me about it. Um, but boy, I was good at it. Um, you know, the other thing that I discovered was, you know, this, this, this passion uh, for the international business that I had was really deep really strong. I'm the uh, director of engineering for all the refrigeration products as well as the gas cooking appliances. At Neil for the first time in either 1987 or 88 I was designing a restaurant chain in Tokyo and Neil had just come over and was forming his own manufacturer's rep group. His uh, home base was the Philippines but he had an interesting situation. Since he was only on a visa he had to leave the Philippines every two weeks or his visa would have expired. It was, it, was, it was great because, you know, this passion that I had found, this uh, dream that I had found as an exchange student in London, that was one thing. Um, but the countries of Asia, you know, as far as, you know, being magical and mystical and, you know, the, the sort of cultures, the diversity, um, 
was just overwhelming to a young guy like me. But I knew him in Tokyo. Uh, he sold me several pieces of equipment that went into our restaurant chain known as uh, the Becker's Company. And it was a fast food company. And we actually made hamburgers. And uh, my favorite story is when we opened our restaurant in Shinjuku, which is the business district of Tokyo, we closed the nearest McDonald's because people liked our restaurant better. When Neil sold his name and his brand, ultimately to Middleby Marshall, which let him then uh, form Greenfield World Trade, as well as the legacy companies, which is what he manages today. This is my first book, it's called Conscientious Equity, an American Entrepreneur Solutions to the World's Greatest Problems. As I was living in Asia, you know, I found that there was a lot of inequities, a lot of things, you know, as a young idealistic American going there and seeing all this poverty and all these social ills. And it really bothered me. And, you know, at first you want to try to save them all, you know, and you say, well, this is my mission. I want to save these people. Mothers, you know, you know letting their kids play in contaminated rivers and, and cooking with the waters and, and washing these waters coming from from this and knowing the disease and everything that was there and you know nobody was saying or doing anything about it and, and, and that's just one small example but it, you know the many many examples like that and then on the other side I seen all of the barriers um, the manipulations the distortions that our foreign trading partners uh, put up against American products I have been here for four and a half years I started in the parts department. When I arrived here, there was a company that was growing so fast that the parts were in a bit of a disarray. So they needed a parts guy and that's where I started. And then the then director of technical service knew that I'd been in the business for a number of years and he asked me to come into the technical service department. And that's where I am today. This company is growing so fast, obviously due to Mr. Asbury and he's constantly buying companies all the time. So we struggle to keep up with him. Uh, he gives us uh, three goals, which are come up with new products, work with the plants to make them more efficient, and uh, by the same token, uh, stay aware of trends in the industry such that uh, our product line stays competitive. You know, we blink our eyes and there's another company that we now own with a whole set of different parameters, different technical service. I must say that he, does, he doesn't push us into handling their technical service. He likes to buy companies and almost leave them to continue as what they were doing before. But uh, Neil is not afraid to invest in infrastructure. He's not afraid to invest in new technology. He's not afraid to invest in uh, companies that appear to have uh, a life that other people don't see by uh, using his vision. He's going to continue like that. He's going to continue buying companies and growing and growing and growing. In this next year, we're going to continue to grow through acquisition, through buying businesses, making the overall company uh, more healthy because of buying these businesses. They bring us talent. They bring us customers. They bring us products. They bring us technology. They bring us manufacturing facilities. You know, so it's really exciting to buy these businesses and then add it into the overall legacy companies and see what the final result of that is. Is that I believe that the vast majority of the wealth in this world has still not yet been created. So whatever is out there today, whatever wealth has been created, it's still relatively small compared to what is going to happen in this world. You know, when you see these companies that come out of nowhere and create this massive amount of wealth, you know, you say, wow, um, you know, things like, if well, you look at the market capitalization of companies like, uh, like, like Google and companies like um, Facebook and some of these 
uh, technology companies that just makes your head rattle. But the amount of wealth that will be created in the future is even so much greater than that.